Let me pray for our reflections on this passage. Our Lord and our God, we ask that you would help us to hear your voice today in whatever circumstance or situation we might find ourselves. For the, those who might be uh, discouraged, um, downcast, uh, hearts heavy, we pray that they would hear a voice of grace, kindness, and care today. For those of us who have questions and doubts, uh, we pray that uh, you give confidence and clarity. And we ask that uh, you who knows our situation far better than we know ourselves uh, would uh, minister to us in the way that uh, we need it today and that you know. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Using British slang for children in an article entitled Nippers Not Wanted, The Economist magazine highlighted a trend among certain businesses limiting or banning infants and children. So a sushi bar in Virginia had banned all diners under the age of 18. Old Salty, a North Carolina restaurant, allows kids but has a no-tolerance policy for screamers. And Malaysian Airlines bans infants from first class and offers child-free zones in economy on some planes. And right now, some of you probably are tempted to pull your phone out and see if they fly out of Philadelphia on any of the routes that you need. Uh, Hot Beer, a craft beer bar in Brooklyn, recently barred children entirely. Its owner was fed up with parents who thought their kids de deserved uh, VIP treatment, even though they were only drinking milk. And one pair of parents asked for the music to be turned down because their five-month-old was trying to sleep at the bar. Uh, there was uh, one incident where a dog bit a little girl after she pet it. The dog and the owner fled, so the family blamed the bartender. Parents might be appalled at such callous disregard for children. Non-parents or parents who have secured babysitters may be thankful for a haven from the shrill cries of little ones. But in our passage this morning, the disciples act like these frustrated business owners turning away children who are being brought to Jesus. But Jesus makes clear that in his establishment, in the kingdom of God, Children are not only welcome, they illustrate the deepest core values of Jesus and his kingdom. They illustrate the deepest core values of his church. So this morning we're going to look at the obstacle of the disciples, the welcome of Jesus, and then the kid-friendly kingdom of God. So obstacle, welcome, and the kingdom. First, the obstacle of the disciples. In verse 13, we have Yet another mission failure by the followers of Jesus. Jesus has become well known. Many are seeking his blessing for their children. And ironically, the guardians of these children have a more accurate view of Jesus and expectation of his warm welcome than his followers who have been spending so much time with him being trained by him. Rather than welcoming these children and their caregivers, the disciples rebuke them. That's a loaded word because it's often the language of exorcism. And most honest parents may admit that their children can be little hellions at times, but the disciples' attitude reveals more about them than about uh, the children they are blocking. Shortly before this, there's a passage where the disciples are arguing about which of them deserves the MVD Award, most valuable disciple, uh, who's the greatest among them. And they continue to misunderstand the nature of Jesus's kingdom. They've slipped into an, a worldly attitude about the children being brought to Jesus and where they fit in their important work. They are convinced that they are part of an important movement that will change their nation, maybe even their world forever. And they were right but the way that they're applying it, they're only half right. The problem is they've twisted that sense of the importance of what they're participating in to focus on their importance and made it an excuse or even a justification to sideline children. I'm sorry, Jesus doesn't have time for you. Can't you see that we're on a mission for God and we need people who can really contribute? Adults, grown-ups like us. And lots of us can slip into this even when we're serving in the church. So I had a friend who shared a story that just after finishing his PhD and getting hired as a seminary professor, he was visiting home. And his mom asked for help as she was working on the lesson for the Sunday school class that she still taught at her church. But my friend just wanted to sit and read the newspaper and enjoy his breakfast. 
So eventually his mom called him out. Oh, big seminary professor doesn't have time for Sunday school. And he realized that probably wasn't the attitude that he should have or be modeling as a future uh, instructor of pastors and, and church leaders. Our overinflated egos can easily become an obstacle to welcoming and loving children or anyone who we don't think is as important as us in our work. So the disciples try to sideline the kids and effectively have Jesus sideline the disciples. The obstacle they pose contrasts with the welcome of Jesus. Jesus is indignant about this incident. He has a righteous anger against the self-inflated attitude of his disciples. They should know better by now. They've had conversations about stuff like this many times already. Jesus had squashed what we could call an infantile argument not that much earlier by putting a child in their midst and telling them, whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. So Jesus shows them what that should look like. He welcomes children and makes sure his disciples know that that attitude should be theirs as well. He gives his instruction twice. He gives it positively and negatively. Let the children come to me, positive, and then do not stop them, negative. And it's as if Jesus is trying to speak very clearly and very slowly so that his slow-witted followers will be able to get it. And they needed it, and sometimes we do too. For Jesus says, his kingdom is a kid-friendly kingdom. His kingdom is a kid-friendly kingdom. He he says it emphatically. Whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will not enter it. There's something about children without which we cannot enter the kingdom of God. What exactly is that? There's two different ways to understand what Jesus says here in this particular passage. On one hand, Jesus could be saying, whoever does not receive the kingdom in a childlike way will not enter it. So commentators will then usually focus on some feature of childhood uh, that we are supposed to practice. So options include innocence or spontaneity or authenticity or dependence or vulnerability. Although on another occasion in the Gospel of Matthew, um, which is a theme that actually uh, Ian just alluded to, Jesus explains whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Humility is a key theme of Jesus' teaching, but also his person. Uh, He describes himself as gentle and humble of heart. In the ancient world, humility was not a virtue. It wasn't something that was celebrated. Humility was associated with weakness. You wanted to be strong. You wanted to not need to be humble because you wanted to not have to rely on other people. And Jesus flipped that value on its head. In the ancient world, there's more like the idea of humiliation. And so if we are called to humility, it's not a call to embodying a virtue of childlike innocence, but to confessing childish weakness and vulnerability. But Jesus' turn of phrase can also be taken in another way. He often does this on purpose so that we reflect on his words and kind of see all the different nuances of his teaching. Jesus could also be saying, and maybe intentionally including the idea of, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God by receiving a child will not enter it. In other words, we receive God's kingdom if and when we receive a child, whether in our families, our church families, or in our communities. This uh, idea, this uh, understanding actually meshes very closely with the words that I mentioned earlier and had earlier in the service. Whoever welcomes a child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me welcomes not me, but him who sent me, God the Father. By welcoming children, in some way we're actually receiving the king of the kingdom himself in them. So obviously this is a big deal for Jesus. But given how child-centered our culture is, we can easily miss how countercultural and transformative this was when Jesus taught it. In Jesus' day, infant mortality was extremely high, and so it was easy to have a callous or calculating attitude towards children. 
Childhood was not a treasured stage of life for stimulating, exploratory, and educational play. It was a relatively brief period, usually over by the age of 13, at which point children became useful members of society as farmers or soldiers or as brides. Unwanted newborns were regularly exposed to die, and in times of famine or upheaval, it was common for adults or caregivers to abandon children to fend for themselves. Even in Jewish society, which had a relatively high regard for families, children were regularly classed with women and with slaves as essentially second-class people. Now, coming to our modern society, and we have Children's Place and PBS Kids and Baby Mozart, it's often hard for us to fathom such an attitude. But our own society is not exempt Under the veneer of normalcy, we are still struggling to recognize the widespread and long-standing problem of childhood neglect and abuse. As a nation, we have normalized abortion, denying the guilt and shame that women later often experience who make that choice. Just a few years ago, our government was forcibly separating children from families to try to deter migrants crossing the border. And even in safe and stable homes, our profound selfishness can often lead us to sacrifice our children's best interests for our own idols, whether that is of leisure or of career or of our own validation of our role as parents in their accomplishments, which is often driving kids to feel more anxious, more depressed, and more overwhelmed. And I admit that I'm not exempt to worshiping my idols rather than loving my family. My children are an incredible blessing from God, but I often resent the demands of parenting. Last year, we took our family cruise together. It was the first cruise we ever did, uh, but uh, it was wonderful. I'm very tempted to do it again because there was all this programming and activity for kids. It was fantastic. Uh, and the then... They had all their programming, but then there was also these adults-only sections, and in the adults-only sections, there was something called quiet, and there was adult beverages, and there was quiet. And uh, not even my own kids were allowed to come in there. But uh, Jesus says that a child's interruption of our busy day or week is actually a vehicle for the kingdom of God. How is that? Well, the gap between a child and an adult is something of an illustration of the gap between us and God our Father. As a parent myself, God regularly reflects back to me my own childish foolishness in the behavior of my children, who have grown out of it entirely. Uh, In their younger years, with their tantrums and tears, I saw my own heart exposed. I may have learned many adult strategies to cloak the turmoil of my heart, but it's all still in there. I treat my father in heaven just like a child treats her parents. I melt down emotionally at the smallest provocation. I distrust his good plans for me. I continually think only of myself. I love things more than people. I crave what I lack and what's not good for me while I'm being ungrateful for God's gifts of all the things I do enjoy and need. God also reveals his heart in my responses. In my love for my kids, I see the smallest glimmers of his profound love for me. In my frustration and impatience, I'm reminded of the incomprehensible depths of the love of God for me and the way he shows that in patience and self-sacrifice. Children reveal the kingdom of God to us. We see ourselves in the newborn whose only ability is to receive nourishment. We see ourselves in the screaming toddler who resents the loving intervention of an adult who takes away the kitchen knife that they found or grabs them before they run in front of the car. We see ourselves in the snotty and smelly child who has soiled themselves and whose only loveliness comes from the fact that they are your child or your grandchild or your niece or your nephew. And we see our Father in heaven in the instinct of parents, at least good parents, to leap any hurdle in order to protect and provide for their child in need. 
So how can we make sure that we aren't that obstacle like the disciples? I want to uh, highlight two specific ways that we can do that. First, to be very specific, uh, we try to avoid putting obstacles of sin in their lives. Jesus warned, again, in the same uh, season of teaching his disciples, uh, back in chapter 9, if you have your Bibles open, Jesus warned, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. Modern translation, it would be better for the mafia to give you cement shoes and drop you in the Schuylkill River than to cause a child to sin. Now, Jesus is probably using the language of little ones to refer to all of God's people, those who believe in him. And so that's a little picture to all of us of how much God cares for us and how uh, aggrieved he is when uh, we are afflicted uh, by those who lead us into sin. But it's equally relevant for literal, literal little ones. And this is particularly important for us as a church. Over the last 30 years or so, the depth and the breadth of the problem of child abuse has become widely recognized, and it's something that permeates all of the institutions of our societies, whether churches or schools or sports clubs. Children who suffer abuse are victims in many ways, and one of the most tragic elements is that that often clouds their perception of the place where that abuse happens. And so when it happens in the church, children often have a lifelong aversion to the very place where Jesus most readily meets people as the one who can deliver us from the shame of being sinned against. And that's why, very practically, we have background checks for child care volunteers and workers. We always work in two-person teams to avoid any hint of or opportunity for evil. And for those of you who serve in those areas, thank you. For Brennan and Danielle who are leading us in those areas, thank you for serving us. Thank you for volunteering uh, week in and week out. Because as uh, somebody who has volunteered many times uh, in child care, I know how bumpy some of those rooms can get, right? Tommy bumps their head, starts crying, startles Sally, and then she starts crying too. And that's when Annie needs the toilet and Caleb takes Andrew's toys. And yes, all of those names have been changed to protect the guilty. <laughs> but when the volunteer with kids just making that nursery or classroom a place of warmth and safety, when a volunteer does that, you are teaching a lesson to a child. Sometimes before they will ever remember it, long term, you are teaching a lesson about the warmth and welcome and love and safety of the Father. So thank you for those who are serving. And if you aren't, you might consider signing up. I'm sure Danielle or uh, Brennan would be happy to add you to the roster. Uh, Also, I want to say I appreciate the hassle of um, doing background checks. I actually remembered one time I was doing my background checks, uh, and I was like, oh, finally, got that done. And then they got mailed back to me because I had not put the confirmation from my first background check into the envelope for the second background check, so I had to go back and restart the whole process. So thank you for those of you who are doing that, and a big thanks to Jordan who helps us organize that. Uh, and then the last piece would just be, um, it's easy in, the, in any situation, um, whether it's in the church, a local school, when you're volunteering, right? Sometimes you're like, I just want to come volunteer in the church. I have to do all this paperwork. Uh, it's easy to think we all know each other. Sadly, that's exactly what people with predatory instincts will uh, take advantage of. And so as the Russian proverb adopted by Ronald Reagan goes, we will trust, but verify. So one practical thing. Second, we, we ourselves have to know the goodness and grace of Jesus. This passage opens with other people bringing children, other people in the lives of these children, parents, grandparents, older siblings, family, friends, aunts and uncles. A child could be a 12-year-old girl in an earlier story in Mark, but some of these children Jesus takes into his arms. No doubt there are infants and toddlers carried in slings or on hips or riding on shoulders. And the people bringing them to Jesus understand that he is someone of such unparalleled goodness that they long for their children to be in his presence and to receive blessing from him. And that's why we invest in Liberty Kids, in our communicants class, and in Hive, our new program for middle school and high school students. Some of us, like me, first met Jesus through our parents 
or through a Sunday school teacher or through friends who invited me to youth group. And that's also why we love for kids to be with us in worship as much of the service as possible, even when they make noise, right? It's just so, you, you know the instinct for them, right? Because it's just so cool to hear your own voice echo through the room when everybody else is being quiet. So when one of us is suffering that moment of uh, extreme mortified embarrassment as a parent, let's remind one another that Jesus loved children crying out uh, for him and said rocks would do it if they didn't. Because Jesus' open welcome of children speaks to all of us, young, old, and somewhere in between. Jesus puts the question in front of us, do you realize that the only way to enter the kingdom is as a child does? And how is that most fundamentally? It's not about youth or innocence or spiritual perceptiveness. In this passage, the children are all brought by someone else. They receive the kingdom as a gift because others in their lives bring them to Jesus and Jesus welcomes them. Because none of us deserves welcome. We all deserve the rebuke Jesus gives to his pushy disciples. But Jesus has fulfilled his own, his own kingdom requirement of childlikeness. None of us had the option of bypassing the humility and the humiliation and the vulnerability of childhood. We all had to endure it. But Jesus did it. He's actually the only voluntary child. And what humility it was for the creator of the universe to become a baby, to become a fetus, to become an embryo dependent upon his own creature to sustain his vulnerable life and a vulnerability that was necessary and that he took to himself so that he could give his life for us. How can we trust, how can we uh, doubt the goodness and welcome of the one who is willing to be so humbled? Let the children come. Come yourself. As we see here, Jesus will not turn you away. I proclaim this good news to you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.